October the 28th, 1951. The supercharged Alfetta of Juan Manuel Fangio wins the Spanish Grand Prix. No one knew it then, but a chapter of motor racing history had ended. In fact, one had to wait until July the 1st, 1979, nearly three decades later, before a forced induction engine would again win a Grand Prix. In between time, various factors contributed towards the falling from favour of this technology, which had largely dominated Grand Prix racing since the mid-1920s through to the start of the 50s. If they have equal capacities, a forced induction engine will give more power than a normally aspirated engine because it takes in more oxygen and therefore more fuel-air mixture, and that will give it more power. That's why the sporting regulations have always had to try and find a balance and therefore impose a capacity handicap on a forced induction engine, supercharged or turbocharged. In 1951, this handicap was one to three and the turbocharged Alfetta with one and a half litres had more and more trouble trying to beat the Ferrari, which was four and a half litres. The compressor was a volumetric which was entrained by the motor itself. Alors le moteur développait euh, plus de 400 chevaux, mais il fallait 150 chevaux pour, en, pour entraîner le compresseur. C'est-à-dire que les organes internes du moteur devaient délivrer les 400 chevaux dont on avait besoin pour entraîner les voitures, plus les 150 chevaux du compresseur. Pour ne pas casser les moteurs, on utilisait de l'alcool qui est un carburant euh, particulier. Il a un, une qualité euh, exceptionnelle, c'est sa chaleur latente de vaporisation. C'est-à-dire que quand on introduit de l'alcool dans un moteur, on absorbe la chaleur de ce moteur. Et on refroidit en particulier tout l'intérieur, la chambre de combustion, les soupapes, la tête de piston. Et c'est comme ça qu'on pouvait faire tenir des moteurs qui, sans ça, auraient été beaucoup trop sollicités. So, Alfa Romeo pulled out at the end of the 1951 season, and forced induction engines disappeared from Formula One. But towards the end of the 60s at Indianapolis, forced induction engines reappeared, no longer supercharged, but turbocharged, a technology developed in the aviation field. The turbo compressor is an accessoire that is added to the motor. The turbo compressor is composed of two parts, one part turbine and one part compressor. Les gaz d'échappement rentrent à haute vitesse dans le carter de turbine et entraînent la roue de turbine. Voici la roue de turbine. La roue de compresseur est reliée à la roue de turbine par l'intermédiaire d'un arbre. Donc la roue de compresseur tourne à la même vitesse que la roue de turbine. La rotation de cette roue de compresseur permet d'aspirer les gaz frais à l'extérieur et par rotation de comprimer les gaz frais vers le moteur. In the 70s, motor racing's governing body had reduced the handicap of forced induction engines by one third. At Renault, Jean Terremorsi could see the advantages of this and pledged to take his company to the peak of motorsport, but he came up against the scepticism of his superiors. Fortunately, he found an ally in the formidable person of Francois Guité of Elf. Les gens de la régie nous ont dit euh, on ne le fera que si vous nous le commandez. Et euh, on l'aura commandé, le premier moteur, 300 000 francs. Et ce moteur a gagné. Alors, ce moteur, c'est amusant de savoir qu'on a reçu une lettre du numéro 2 de la régie à l'époque qui a dit à mon patron de l'époque, c'était Jean Prada, il a dit Mon cher Jean, on va faire ce moteur parce que tu le demandes, mais un, on ne pense pas que nos carrières sont capables de le faire deux, on ne sait pas ce qu'on en fera. And thus was born the Renault Elf team, using the 2-litre V6, which would win European championships in Formula 2 and sports cars. But for Terra Morsi, whose ambitions were higher and greater, this was just a step on the ladder to greater achievements and goals. I have a memory in 1973, where, at the demand of Mr. Terra who was our patron, the Régie Renault, at the course at the time, he m'avait demandé d'aller faire un stage de deux mois aux États-Unis, en Californie, et où je désirais comparer un peu ce qu'était le sport automobile aux États-Unis à l'époque avec ce que nous connaissions, nous, en Europe, ce qui est notablement différent. Et surtout m'informer, dans un deuxième point, de ce, des connaissances du niveau acquis en suralimentation. The plan comprised two phases. The first was to win the Le Mans 24 hour race with a turbocharged 2 litre V6. It didn't happen immediately. But after an experimental outing in 1976, the second effort only just failed, but the third in 1978 was successful. 
At the same time, a secret but parallel program was underway. Gerard Larousse had taken over from Terra Morsi, who had retired due to ill health, and he had put engineer Boudi in charge of the development of a Formula One version of the Renault engine. C'est une étude qui a été assez vite dans la mesure où il ne s'agissait que de modifier certaines caractéristiques de d'alésage de course du moteur pour le ramener à 1500 cm3 et puis évidemment quelques ajustages au niveau des, des admissions des échappements. Once again, Elf's support was needed in order to get the program underway as Renault's cautious directors were loath to invest in it. But Guité wasn't afraid to do so. Jean Terramancy à l'époque a eu l'idée de faire un turbo, mais là aussi les gens de Renault nous ont dit bah on le fera que si vous nous commandez. Alors j'avais rien, on n'avait plus rien sur notre budget à l'époque. Et euh, j'ai été voir le, un garçon euh, qui s'appelait Roger Cléret qui tenait le budget de la préconisation et on lui a dit Roger, on, faut on, il nous faut 500 000 francs. Et il a dit mais pourquoi faire ben, Il a dit un moteur de Formule 1, turbo. Et il a dit mais c'est fou ça et, et donc euh, je ne peux pas payer ça sur le, le contrat de préconisation mais on peut faire une facture et c'est de moteur performant. Et ça a été le début de l'ère du turbo. It was in November 1975 that the 1.5 litre Formula One engine made its first track appearance in Great Secret, hidden under the huge engine cover of a Le Mans Alpine sports car. In March 1976, it was fitted to a modified Formula Two Alpine. This test car, driven by Jean-Pierre Jabouy, would run on various different circuits without attracting too much attention, fortunately it seemed. Le tout premier tour de roue j'ai fait, c'était au Ricard, je m'en rappelle très bien. Et puis quand je me suis arrêté, je ne savais pas comment dire aux ingénieurs que c'était impossible, ça ne marchait pas du tout, parce que, en fin de compte, le turbo, il se mettait en route juste dans la ligne droite euh, du Ricard. Ça veut dire qu'il fonctionnait euh, 10 secondes, même pas. Surtout un tour de circuit, donc euh, je me suis dit, euh, je ne vois pas comment on va arriver à, à faire un moteur qui fonctionne euh, sur tout un tour, parce que là, on était vraiment loin du problème. Et puis ce qui s'est passé, c'est que tout de suite, Bernard Dudo m'a dit euh, « Non, mais on va essayer des turbos différents, ça peut peut-être changer. » Et effectivement, ils ont mis des turbos différents et ça a changé énormément. Testing continued until the great day, July the 29th, 1976, when Larousse was given the green light to go ahead from Bernard Anon, the new president of Renault, who was 100% behind the project. The construction of the first real Renault Formula One car began at the end of the 1976 season, under the direction of the quartet Castang, de Cortens, Guénard and Jabouy. But the pitfalls of engine development and the Le Mans programme delayed the car's official competition debut to July 1977, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Under the somewhat mocking eye of the competition and the general public, what was to become a long and exhaustive program began, and it would take exactly two years. The power was there, but it wasn't easy to harness, and reliability was difficult to find. I remember my first course, Les Anglais et Ken Tyrell en particulier, quand je rentrais au stand, ils éclataient de rire. Quoi. On nous prenait vraiment pour des illuminés. Quoi. On avait l'impression que le moteur turbo, les gens éclataient de rire. Alors forcément, parce qu'on avait des problèmes. Souvent, le moteur rentrait, il y avait des flammes énormément longues parce que le turbo avait cassé, donc lui, il était en feu. Le mécanicien avait une technique, avait un gros manchon et euh, le mettait dans l'échappement pour arrêter les, les, les flammes. Euh, le moteur fumait, donc ils appelaient ça la, la, la TIR jaune, d'ailleurs, bien connue. It didn't take long to get it right, however. The great day arrived on July the 1st, 1979. Success finally came at the French Grand Prix at Dijon, before a delighted home crowd when Jean-Pierre Javoui and the Renault Elf team finally won their first Grand Prix. Furthermore, Arnoux in the second Renault Turbo fought a fantastic duel with Villeneuve's Ferrari, a duel which will remain legendary. The Renault just pipped for third place. As in rugby, Formula One can be a hooligan sport played by gentlemen. Guénard cried, but with joy this time. Perseverance had paid off. Until then, the trials and tribulations of the yellow teapot had been followed with curious condescension by the English team owners, who, under the umbrella organization of the Formula One Constructors Association, held political sway in Formula One. 
they appreciated the increased media coverage that the involvement of a major manufacturer such as Renault brought with its huge means of communication, the more so when they were able to beat their cars every Sunday. They were delighted that Renault were able to promote Formula One for free. That was their kind of business. But they began to worry in 1981 when Prost, now driving for Renault Elf, emulated Jabouille's success at Dijon, where he won the first Grand Prix of his career. At the same time, Ferrari got the message and took the turbo route too. The English wanted to stick to their cheaper Ford Cosworth engines. Now they called for the plain and simple banning of the turbo. But they came up against a formidable opponent in Jean-Marie Ballest, president of the governing body FISA, who saw his own organization being overshadowed by the English and decided that the Renault-Ferrari turbo issue was one on which he could take a stand and re-establish his political status. And so began the FISA focal war, a sometimes colorful but usually merciless conflict which was to last two years. Foca, threatening to create their own rival sporting authority, boycotted the 1982 San Marino Grand Prix. The field was reduced to a meagre 14 cars, although in reality it was a Renault versus Ferrari duel. Prost and Arnoux on one side, Peroni and Villeneuve on the other, the four of them putting on a fine show until the Renaults broke. Then the Ferrari drivers found themselves in what turned out to be an unhealthy battle. Pironi won, but Villeneuve contested the ethics of his win. And he would pay for this quarrel with his life two weeks later, taking one risk too many when trying to beat his rival's time. As the Renaults still seemed too temperamental, Pironi built on his success and seemed destined to become the first world champion in a turbocharged car at the end of the year. But two months after Villeneuve, he in turn was victim of a bad accident. And as Renault weren't in a position to take advantage of Ferrari's bad luck, it was finally Rosberg who delayed the inevitable outclassing of Ford Cosworth's V8. So one had to wait until 1983 for a turbo-engined car to win the world title for the first time. And in spite of Lotus's support, it was not a Renault-powered car. It wasn't to be a Ferrari either, for they failed to take advantage of their advance. But instead, it was a relative newcomer BMW powering Nelson Piquet's Brabham. It was a historical success and one that was amusingly ironic. For, after all, this Brabham belonged to the president of FOCA, the organization which had been at the forefront of the anti-turbo lobby. Even so, the pioneers of turbocharging weren't beaten until the very last Grand Prix of the year at Kyalami, after Prost had dominated the first half of the season. But Renault's defeat was one of the most costly in the history of motorsport. Their programme wasn't perhaps tackled with all the necessary foresight and thoroughness required, but it is a fact that it was Renault and no one else who revolutionised the technology of Grand Prix engines and demonstrated that its progress was in the right direction, against the authoritative advice of such well-known companies as Porsche and Cosworth. Taking the view that only fools don't change their minds, Porsche, approached by McLaren, built their own turbo, which made its debut at the end of the 1983 season. The Anglo-German team signed Alain Prost alongside Niki Lauda. But the Germans weren't the first to follow the example of Renault and Ferrari. The Japanese, in the shape of Honda, had already dipped their toes in the water with the humble spirit team, while they ironed out the bugs and development of their V6 turbo. At the end of 1983, they took their first serious steps by installing the engine in a Williams. Now, with the 84 season looming, Formula Turbo was very much a reality. The new generation of turbo engines outclassed early models, such as BMW's four-cylinder and even Renault's V6 was a little long in the tooth now. It was worse still for Brian Hart's four-cylinder, which was never really competitive. 
In fact, for the next two years, the battle for supremacy featured only the V6 Tag Porsche-powered McLarens and the V6 Honda-powered Williamses. The advanced technology of these engines, plus the advanced chassis and the team's organization, meant that none of their rivals had a chance. But in 1984, it was McLaren and the Tag Porsche which totally dominated, taking 12 victories in total, a remarkable record in such a competitive environment. But the struggle for the title was undecided between Lauda and Prost. It was only at the end of a fascinating battle in the final round at Estoril that it was decided, with the Austrian winning the title for the third time, beating the Frenchman by the minute margin of a half point. A year later, Prost reaped his revenge on Lauda by winning his first world championship title by 20 points. He had reached the peak of his sport and the McLaren, conceived by designer John Barnard, was the best available. This formidable combination, which had had an effect rarely seen in the history of Formula One, had established new standards. But by 1986, Honda's engine had made up ground and was now superior to the tag Porsche. Prost was hard pushed to retain his title against the combined efforts of Williams drivers Mansell and Piquet. Fortunately for him, apart from his talent of getting the best out of his equipment at all times, circumstances would also come down in his favor. Mansell virtually had the title in his pocket at the final round in Adelaide, Australia, when he suffered a spectacular blowout. And against all predictions, Prost, beaten on paper, became the surprise winner and just held on to win his second title. But it was very close. For economic reasons, however, Renault Elf had to pull out. The Turbo Pioneers had won 20 races, but no title. From now on, they would remain engine suppliers. BMW, the engine to beat in 1983, were now almost also rans. From 1987 onwards, it was Honda who would dominate. The Japanese engine's power output continued to rise, and Ferrari, still seeking to be as competitive as they were from 82 to 85, could do nothing about them. Only McLaren could occasionally rival Williams, but the Porsche engine was at the end of its development and the Honda took the upper hand. Piquet and Mansell, however, fought against one another within the team and Frank Williams could do nothing about it. Piquet suffered the after effects of an accident earlier in the season, but was still able to destabilize the fragile Mansell who injured himself during practice for the Japanese Grand Prix and lost the title. This inter-team battle upset Honda's management. Ron Dennis managed to persuade the Japanese engine manufacturer to leave Williams, whose indiscipline they disapproved of, and moved to McLaren where Dennis had signed Senna to line up alongside Prost. But even though the Japanese had put their money on the right team, they were not to find things any more calm at McLaren. They had jumped out of the frying pan and into the fire, for Dennis was no better at controlling his hotheads than Williams had been. Senna turned out to be the quicker of the two, but Prost was more of a tactician. They won one race after another, and McLaren enjoyed almost total and unprecedented domination. The team won 15 Grand Prix out of 16, with just the Italian Grand Prix missing from the record. Senna crashed out. But just as the tally of victories mounted up, so too did the temperature of rivalry between the two drivers. It would be decided at Suzuka, where, having completely messed up his start, Senna turned a rain shower to his advantage in order to catch Prost, whose aversion to rain proved decisive. In 
It was the final blow. Prost was beaten, Senna was the new champion. Sometimes rash, but often inspired, the Brazilian had beaten the professor. Honda had finally won at home and reigned supreme in Formula One. The top leading man has a strong will to win. We should win and win. This is most important. To make the, the organization very simple and in a practical manner, they can judge and they can do. This is the second thing from the organization point. And for the budget, you should not give too much. And in a very severe condition, even budget, they can cultivate their strong, challenging spirit by themselves using their wisdom. But this determination, allied to the staggering progress made in electronic technology, promoted an astonishing rise in performance, which alarmed the governing body. From 500 brake horsepower in 1977, Senna's Lotus Renault in qualifying form for the Monaco Grand Prix in 1987 had close to 1,500 bhp, almost a three-fold rise in power in 10 years. A circuit such as this, in terms of safety, seemed totally inappropriate when it came to that kind of progress. By this stage, there was also clear domination by Honda, with no one coming forward to challenge the Japanese company. Fisa listened carefully to the arguments of those who remembered the good old days of what was Formula Cosworth and pleaded for normally aspirated engines again. Si voleva limitare l'escalation, per cui furono installate delle popo valve che limitavano la pressione di utilizzazione del turbo, limitando per conseguenza la potenza. Fu fatto in due parti, prima con una una limitazione un po' più larga per non penalizzare troppo e l'ultimo anno con una penalizzazione più bassa per cominciare a introdurre nello stesso momento i motori aspirati nelle gare di Formula 1. Furthermore, it has to be said that FISA had reduced the size of fuel tanks, which had placed a fuel consumption limit on turbo engined cars. This had caused cars to run out of fuel or to cruise slowly in order to conserve fuel and had made a mockery out of Grand Prix, no longer races of speed and now incomprehensible to the public. Formula Turbo's days were now numbered. Sarebbe stato molto più economico e facile e se si vuol dire che la potenza è contro la sicurezza ridurre la cilindrata. Ridurre, ogni anno le fabbriche che fanno motori ricostruiscono i propri motori. Sarebbe stato molto semplice ridurre la cilindrata a 1000 cm cubi lasciando i tecnici che erano diventati esperti in questo campo di sviluppare ulteriormente. I benefici enormi che ne hanno avuto le macchine di serie. Oggi ci sono delle vetture a motore turbo che a 120 km all'ora fanno con un litro anche 12-13 km all'ora, motori di 2-3 litri. Quindi questi sono dei grossi vantaggi in termini di economia generale, di nazione. Quindi io sono dispiaciuto che il motore turbo sia stato fatto sparire. Something had to be done to reduce the endless rise of power. But the total banning of the turbo wasn't necessarily the right thing. As Lamborghini's chief engineer Mauro Forghieri suggested, a reduction of capacity might have been more advisable. That way, an avenue of progress, one of the sport's missions, would have remained open rather than closed. Yes, the epoch of Formula Turbo was one of nonsense, excess, and possibly even insanity. But it was also stirring, dynamic and exciting for those who were able to live in this golden age of Formula One.
motor racing was conceived at the turn of the century to exploit and enjoy speed. In its early days, this simple aim was enough to thrill the public. But soon, accidents, incidents and the introduction of closed circuits added a new dramatic dimension to this noble sport, and it became a modern version of the Roman games. For everyone, risk began to outweigh progress. The notion of accident, of death even, became inseparable from the sport itself and the fascination that it exuded. It was, besides, the natural consequence of almost inevitable martyrdom. In fact, up until the end of the 60s, fate dictated that one Grand Prix driver in 10 would be killed during each Grand Prix season. The idea of safety for drivers until then was almost ignored by those who ran the sport, more concerned with the protection of spectators. It was understood that the drivers themselves only raced because they loved to court danger. But while Grand Prix cars became more and more powerful, the circuits themselves remained unchanged and accidents became more and more serious and frequent. So, under the leadership of three times world champion Jackie Stewart, drivers started a campaign to force circuit owners to build their tracks and runoff areas in a way which would minimize the consequences of accidents. I suppose my big interest came when I had an accident at Spa-Francorchamps in 1966 which showed up a tremendous lack of awareness for safety. Because of the poor facilities, I could have lost my life because of bad medical attention at the track, because of bad safety uh, facilities, etc. At that time, the tracks were terribly dangerous. There were no barriers. There were earth banks that were no more than launching pads uh, for the race cars when they left the track. There were trees that were there unnecessarily and many other hazards that could have been avoided. Certainly the most difficult to influence to begin with were the race tracks themselves and the organizers. They simply did not want to spend money and they felt that if you were a racing driver, you were a sort of gladiator figure who was paid to take risks. At that time, the race cars themselves had a lot to be done, but we were not advanced enough in our thinking to look at that side of it at that moment. I think the strongest lobby was unquestionably through the media. Who the people were behind that lobby, I to this day still do not know. But I suspect it was the track owners at that time who were seeing their money having to be spent on facilities that were not going to improve their gait or their pocket. The biggest help really were the the top line drivers who were prepared to assist, who were prepared to stand with me. Some of them were less strong. Uh, they had commercial interests. Their teams were putting a lot of pressure onto them. If a track wasn't safe enough and we decided not to race there or to ask for changes, some of the team managers were not very kind. The rest of the drivers, in some cases, were not very supportive, even though they were being themselves helped which disappointed me very much. In my own case, and, and in the era that I drove in, um, I'd been wanting to be a racing driver for so long that one never even gave any thought to the question of safety, uh, either one's own safety or, or the car. One was just so pleased to, uh, to be able to, to race a car. I mean, it was nice to get paid or get some money for doing something I wanted to do and loved doing anyway, but uh, I'd really have done it for nothing. So, yeah. You know, you were doing something that you loved and, and uh, if something went wrong, well, you just accepted that as, as part of what you were doing. Um, I often thought, I mean, you know, one talked about trying to make the cars a bit more secure, but, you know, with somebody like Colin Chapman, uh, <laughs> it was a little difficult. 
There were therefore two areas to be tackled. Tradition dictated that while Formula One symbolised the ultimate in motor racing, it was quite natural for it to be dangerous. There was no question that it should be made less risky, for it might devalue it. This point of view was appallingly expressed by Louis Chiron, a star of the 30s, who proclaimed that at present drivers no longer know how to die. Today, however, the idea that everything should be done to make Formula One as safe as possible is no longer considered strange, but is even encouraged. So, for the last 20 years, circuits as a whole have undergone changes. The first Grand Prix at the turn of the century were at least run on closed roads, but very often the lap length was as much as 60 miles, which restricted rapid and efficient rescue in case of accident. Tracks were scarcely even surfaced, so grip and visibility were minimal, while the almost brakeless cars were narrow and tall, which made them very unstable. In the 20s, road surfaces improved, but still, most Grand Prix venues were little more than public roads closed for the weekend with little or no preparation. Finally, however, circuits specifically designed and built for motor racing began to appear. For a long time, the Nürburgring in West Germany was considered the perfect example. 13 and a half miles of twisting, curving road winding through the Eiffel Mountains was a majestic test of men and machines worthy of this grandiose sport, the ultimate way to separate the men from the boys. But majestic as it may have been, this circuit of circuits was boycotted in 1970 when the drivers considered it outdated and unsuitable for modern Formula One cars. Revised at great cost, it was again the venue for the German Grand Prix until 1976. But that year, world champion Nicky Lauda almost lost his life. It was only the brave actions of three of his colleagues making up for the lack of official help, which saved him. That was the end of the Nürburgring, since replaced by Hockenheim, much less majestic, but with facilities which met modern safety criteria. However, these facilities, while being able to reduce the consequences of an accident, could not prevent them. So it was that during the 1982 German Grand Prix, Didier Peroni was a victim of a terrible accident with Alain Prost. C'était absolument épouvantable. Je me rappelle très très bien. Avant, il m'a percuté par l'arrière droit à pleine vitesse. Il est monté, je sais pas, minimum à 4-5 mètres, complètement droit comme ça, et il s'est il s'est ralenti par le par par l'air. Il a d'abord touché l'arrière et après et après bien entendu l'avant. In the rain, the wide open wheels of Formula One cars reduce grip and visibility to zero. A driver is virtually blind when following another car. Prost's own accident on the pit straight during the 1985 Portuguese Grand Prix is a prime example of the problem. J'étais derrière Helio De Angelis. Dans ces cas-là, il y a les deux les marques des, des roues, donc euh, il vaut mieux rester dans les dans les marques des roues. J'ai peut-être été un petit peu plus à droite ou à gauche. Je sais pas exactement ce qui s'est passé, mais je suis parti en aquaplaning. What, then, are the safety measures demanded for a modern circuit? First of all, it should be no longer than three and a half miles in length for speed of rescue in case of an accident. Runoff areas should be wide and level, bordered by either barriers or concrete walls which are lined by piles of old tires or fencing where a frontal impact is likely. Soft sand can slow an errant car while corners should be lined by curbing or rumble strips, slightly angled so that they don't launch a car into overturning. However, it isn't always possible to make a street circuit such as Monaco entirely safe, but a modern track will often prove the worth of these measures. Since these measures have been enforced, then, the tragic role has been reduced. Cars still leave the track, of course, and sadly, there are still injuries. But fatalities are happily rarer than ever. One of the reasons for that statistic is that medical services, under the direction of Professor Sidney Watkins, have been widely reorganized.
enormous progress has been made because uh, what has happened in the last uh, 10 years has been the evolution at all of the circuits to which Formula One goes uh, of modern medical senses with modern equipment up to the standard of the intensive care unit that you would find in the best hospitals throughout the world. The first phase is to rescue the pilot from the accident. And the modern technique for that is to have interception cars driven by experienced race drivers who are stationed around the circuit. And in each car there will be a doctor, a resuscitation expert, and perhaps a paramedic or a second doctor. And the car will go to the scene of the accident and if necessary, start to resuscitate the driver actually in the car because it's very important to start the treatment immediately or as immediately as one possibly can so as to minimize uh, the effects of the accident. And that is now done in the car. At the same time, in spite of the resistance of the car constructors, the sporting body has implemented tight regulations which guarantee that the drivers can count on certain standards of strength in the cars that they drive. Technical progress has also played its part. Alla fine degli anni 70 e inizio degli anni 80 a livello sicurezza c'era ben poco. Purtroppo furono gli anni di, di grossi e tragici incidenti. Dall'82 fu l'introduzione dei nuovi materiali, i compositi. Passiamo dalle vetture classiche in metallo alle vetture composite. Un'altra data importante fu quattro anni fa quando passammo al crash test vero e proprio. Oltre alla cellula di sopravvivenza fu introdotta la prova d'urto per provarla effettivamente. What was the principle of the survival cell? Diciamo che eh, la, poniamo delle dimensioni minime di costruzione dello chassis, eh, sia come abitabilità del pilota, sia come impiego di materiali, diamo delle dimensioni minime e dei, la qualità minima dei materiali da utilizzare. Philippe Alliot's incredible accident in the 1988 Mexican Grand Prix was proof that these worked. He emerged unscathed from his Lola. Negli anni 50 fino alla fine degli anni 70 il problema dell'incendio fu quello più grave. Oggi possiamo dire che fortunatamente è scomparso questo. Formula One cars have to be fitted with soft fuel tanks, which, like the self-sealing valves and fuel lines, are of aviation standard. A well-indicated exterior cutoff switch and an onboard automatic fire extinguisher are also obligatory. While a tank of medical air will allow a driver to breathe for 30 seconds in a fire without risk of lung damage. In order to win, the constructors sometimes play the role of sorcerer's apprentice. It can't be much fun constantly striving against such tendencies. È difficile dirlo. È difficile dirlo perché entrano in gioco altri elementi, circuiti, piloti. Uh, è un equilibrio sempre difficile da trovare e come dicevi tu prima c'è un costante, una costante corsa da parte dei team per migliorare le prestazioni e da parte della federazione di contenerle in limiti di sicurezza. So the governing body sometimes has to apply the brakes and put a stop to things. Beh, è stato fatto qualche anno fa, è stato fatto adesso col motore atmosferico. Eh, tra le altre ragioni per cui il turbo compressore è stato vietato è stata anche quella di ridurre le potenze a limiti più ragionevoli. Yes, but surely on that point you failed because normally aspirated engines promptly beat the times of the turbo cars. Certamente, il progresso, se ci fossero stati ancora i turbo saremmo ancora più in là. It was also imperative to ensure that Formula One cars with their incredible grip did not become ballistic missiles should they lose control. Consequently, the width of cars' slick tires was limited in the early 80s. The governing body also fought a long battle to contain aerodynamic progress, which was constantly improving grip. It all started at the end of the 60s, when wings were first introduced, but their growth was soon limited after a series of structural failures. The situation reached a peak at the end of the 70s with ground effect. 
the ultimate in this development was Gordon Murray's Brabham, which was equipped with a fan to suck the car to the track. But it was banned after winning its only race. Colin Chapman introduced movable sides to the cars to prevent interference with the airflow under the car and with the shaped underbody produced a Venturi effect which also sucked the car to the track. This was the era of skirts outlawed in 1983. Another important safety area was that of driver's dress. To begin with, they wore blue overalls and a reversed flat hat. In the 30s, Nuvolari wore a skull cap, but it wasn't until post-war that the helmet made its first appearance. Drivers in the 50s still preferred the lightness of a cotton shirt and cloth trousers to anything more robust. Helmets that covered drivers' ears appeared in the 60s, and at the same time, they began to wear underwear and overalls made of fireproof materials. The governing body encouraged this by creating manufacturing standards, and these spread to helmets, while gloves and boots were also made in fireproof materials. This was how drivers fought their fear of fire, the scourge of the 70s. At the same time, circuits became better equipped, and in the 80s, the problem of safety was largely overcome. Many of the tracks have become very safe, but the drivers have become very dangerous. And now it's a question of policing those drivers, not just when they reach Formula One, but when they start off from Formula France or Formula Italy, to Formula Three, to 3000, and finally to Formula One. The driving behaviour, as I see it today, is extremely poor, and that's a human problem. Obviously, it is hard to protect the drivers from one another. But one area in which improvements could be made was at the start, the most dangerous part of the race, when the cars are still closely grouped. The principle of placing cars according to their speed in practice was adopted in 1933. The grid system, utilised in order to limit overtaking when the field was still closely bunched. But the cars became so wide that the system had to be fine-tuned to limit accidents, spacing cars further apart on the grid. A 2x2 two two grid replaced the previous 323 configuration and that was then staggered. But now there was considerable distance between first and last on the grid. It was also necessary to replace the traditional dropping of the national flag with a system of traffic lights. Strange, perhaps, but more visible and now operated by a professional starter used to the tension and problems of Grand Prix starts. This was an attempt to prevent any repeat of accidents such as that at the start of the 1981 Belgian Grand Prix when Siegfried Stoer ran into a mechanic from his own team who was trying to start his teammate's engine when the start was given. It also attempted to prevent the possibility of a car failing to start on the grid and being hit by another. This was tragically illustrated at the start of the 1982 Canadian Grand Prix when Riccardo Paletti hit Didier Peroni's stationary Ferrari at 120 mph. This was strangely ironic. Two months later, Didier Peroni had to be cut from the wreckage of his Ferrari at Hockenheim. He was so badly injured that he thought Professor Watkins recommended immediate amputation, although this is disputed by those involved. He had just re recovered consciousness when I arrived at the accident. He recognized me. Uh, there was already some interception cars there with doctors aboard from the rescue organization at Hockenheim and they had started to resuscitate his blood pressure by setting up intravenous transfusions. His legs were very badly damaged and once uh, we had his blood pressure under good control then we were able to take the uh, remains of the car apart so that he could be removed from the car without adding any damage to his legs. We brought the helicopter actually to the site of the accident 
So when uh, Mr. Peroni was removed from the car, he went straight into the helicopter and I took him to Heidelberg University Hospital. Later, at his own request, Didier was moved to the Choisy Clinic in Paris in the care of Professor Letournel, the orthopedic surgeon nicknamed the surgeon with hands of gold. The problem of the urgence of his leg had been resolved at Heidelberg, and he had to try to recover his function. And malheureusement, he had des dégâts cutanés and des dégâts osseux extrêmement étendus au niveau de la jambe droite, de telle sorte que nous avons été obligés de réaliser ça étape par étape. Et cela a demandé de plusieurs mois et de nombreuses interventions. What sort of men face up to this extraordinary suffering? Vous pouvez dire quel genre d'homme c'est face à la souffrance? Je crois que face à la souffrance, il se comporte comme tous les autres, il ne l'aime pas. Et Didier n'aimait pas plus la souffrance que les autres. Ils avaient cependant, et ils ont tous un courage assez exceptionnel, une volonté de récupération absolument fantastique. Ils sont d'ailleurs, lorsqu'ils sont accidentés, dans des conditions physiques fantastiques et formidables qui facilitent notre travail. Mais la douleur, eh bien, non, ils sont comme les autres. Didier spent many months at Choisy. It was a tough time, punctuated by more than 20 operations under general anaesthetic. La première chose qu'il m'a demandé, c'était si je pensais euh, qu'il pourrait un jour remonter dans une voiture de Formule 1. Et je lui ai dit que c'était très vraisemblable, que et je le pensais très sincèrement. Je crois que mon devoir de traumatologue, c'est euh, au pilote de Formule 1, comme à tous les autres accidentés, de redonner aux blessés les possibilités d'effectuer ce qu'ils effectuaient auparavant. Et au pilote de Formule 1, de remonter dans une voiture. D'ailleurs, Didier, lorsqu'il nous a laissés, était à la veille de remonter dans une voiture de Formule 1, ce qui était pour lui et pour moi une immense joie. Absolument, c'est ma, ma principale motivation. Je veux dire, quand je fais de la rééducation tous les jours, quand j'essaie tous les jours de, de plier euh, mon pied droit à droite à gauche, de l'enfoncer euh, devant en arrière, c'est en pensant à une pédale d'accélérateur et une pédale de frein. Et quand je bouge mon pied gauche, c'est en, en pensant à une pédale d'embrayage. Donc, euh, c'est ma principale motivation de guérison, c'est sûr. Injured in August 1982, it wasn't until four years later that Didier drove a Formula One car again. Gérard Larousse, who was there, was very impressed with his determination. He was very attention to what we didn't see, the handicap he had, I remember. Et quand il s'est glissé dans la voiture, certains qui, dans sa tête, ça devait tourner à 100 à l'heure. The test took place at Dijon in Ligier during a closely guarded private session. Il avait tourné très très bien, de manière très constante à la Didier quoi. C'était un type tellement déterminé et volontaire. Avec une bonne voiture, Didier pouvait vouloir devenir champion du monde. His future, however, was already sealed. We use his recovery as an example of safety in Formula One racing. But it never reached its logical conclusion. Four years later, Didier was killed driving Colibri, a powerful offshore powerboat. In his impatience to get back into Formula One, Didier had instead opted for an aquatic version. It was ironic and cruel that it should have killed him. The moral of the story is that racing remains racing and drivers remain drivers. In spite of all the efforts and all the progress that has been made in safety, it would be wrong to believe that you could turn this high-risk sport into a secure and innocent game. These days, Grand Prix drivers pay for their sport less frequently with their lives. But accidents happen and will continue to happen. They are an integral part of motor racing. But constant vigilance is also vital, particularly concerning technical innovation. If one is to avoid the terrible toll of the 50s and 60s, when each year it was inevitable that one driver in 10 would not survive the season. <laughs>